In our last lecture, we introduced the order Enterobacteriales and discussed E. coli. Today, we're going to discuss the remainder of the order, focusing on a few key genera. Just like E. coli, these bacteria are all gram-negative rods. And in this picture here, you can see a pure culture of Serratia marcescens. We commonly use selective and differential media for targeting specific members of the order Enterobacteriales. On the left here, you can see a blood agar plate with Salmonella growing on it with kind of generic gray colonies. And then on the right, we have the selective and differential media XLT4, which highlights those organisms producing hydrogen sulfide as black colonies, which is potentially a salmonella. Many of them are normal and common. We're going to start off by talking about salmonella. Uh, these organisms are found in the guts of a wide variety of animals and are oftentimes expected microbiota. They're not abnormal. Their simple presence is not inconsistent with health. There are, however, uh, organism host uh, associations that are recognized. For instance, Salmonella enterica subspecies Arizona is associated with reptiles. We also see geographic variation. So it's not only host relationships, but in different parts of the country, for instance. So in Canada, we have different serotypes of Salmonella that are identified from different agricultural animals. In Canada, Salmonella serotype Enteritidis and Heidelberg are the two most commonly identified in human clinical disease. Um, salmonella is something that's routinely surveilled for antimicrobial resistance, and this is performed by the CPARS program, or the Canadian Integrated Program for Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance. This is done by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And if you're interested, I'm sure you can Google that name um, and find your way to this website here where they publish their annual reports. The nomenclature of Salmonella is a little bit complicated and a little bit confusing. The taxonomic designation of species within this genus has undergone a number of changes since the 1980s. And at present, we have three species withstanding in nomenclature. So these are three officially recognized species. So within the genus Salmonella, we have the species Subterranea, Bongore, and Enterica. And then within Salmonella enterica, we have six subspecies. So Salmonella enterica, subspecies enterica, Salame, Arizona, Diarizona, Houghtonay, and Indica. Within these species and subspecies, we also have a number of serotypes or serovars. Um, there's currently over 2,600 which are recognized. And these serotypes are defined based on the presence of surface antigens. So the O antigens, which are uh, oligosaccharides associated with LPS, and H antigens, which are based on flagellar proteins. Serotyping is something which is done uh, at reference labs. It's not really a routine diagnostic that's going to be done by any sort of commercial fee-for-service lab that uh, you guys are likely to send samples to. In our lab, we've done some research, which has led to the identification of salmonella, uh, from some retail food products. And just as an example, I want to show you what these serotypes uh, potentially can look like. So here we have three different strains that were isolated from retail meats, a Salmonella puna, an Urbana, and a Welta Verden. The Salmonella puna that we submitted for serotyping had the 22nd O antigen. And the flagellar antigens are biphasic. So they can express two different uh, flagellar proteins, which is really useful for immune evasion. Um, for our particular strain, we had the phase one antigen of Z and the phase two antigen of 1,6. And if you look at our other two strains, you can see they're associated uh, O and H antigens. The virulence of Salmonella has been really well studied. Uh, clusters of virulence genes are found on what are called salmonella pathogenicity islands, and virulence factors include type 3 secretion systems. These are sort of like a needle and syringe-like apparatus that the bacteria produce to inject effector molecules. Uh, they detect host cells, and they're involved with evasion. And then also fimbrae, which are important for attachment and colonization. 
Just to give you an idea of what these needle and syringe like apparatus look like, um, I've put a link to a video above where you can see some electron micrographs of secretion systems in Salmonella. I've also put a link to a video where you can see Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Vibrio cholera battling with type 4 secretion systems. So these are proteins which are not only involved in uh, pathogenesis in people, but they play a role in microbe microbe interactions. When reading about Salmonella, you'll frequently see it noted as such, Salmonella and then the serotype in capital letters. You'll note that the genus is italicized, the serotype or serovar is not italicized, and the first letter is capitalized. This will help you to um, differentiate that from a species name. So Salmonella Dublin is one which is host adapted to cattle. It's a cause of severe disease in endemic herds. Um, in young animals, so really young calves, we can see septicemia, acute enteritis in older animals, abortion in pregnant cows, and chronic losses in, in older animals. So we see a chronic enteritis that's associated with inappetence and decreased weight gain, decreased feed conversion, and then also terminal dry gangrene resulting in necrosis of the feet. Management of these infections involve cleaning up calving areas and rodent control, and there are also vaccinations possible. In this image on the right, you can see uh, fibrinonecrotic cholecystitis. So this is inflammation and necrosis of the gallbladder. Salmonella is really interesting in that host-adapted serovars or serotypes often localize to the gallbladder. And so on post-mortem, this can be a really uh, useful site to sample in order to get a diagnosis. Salmonella cholera suis is host-adapted to pigs and maintained by carriers. It's a cause of sepsis, which is the most common manifestation, enterocolitis, and a wide variety of secondary infections following bacteremia. So we have the salmonella moving through the bloodstream, and it can settle out in, for instance, the lungs or the liver. During the acute phase of the disease, we have large numbers of organisms shed in the feces, which really facilitates transmission to other animals. Management of salmonella cholera suis is about reducing stress, so having an appropriate uh, housing density, good nutrition, and of course, control, controlling uh, concurrent infectious diseases. So we want to reduce uh, other immunosuppressive conditions that can help to reduce uh, shedding by carriers. Autogenous bacterins, which are sort of like a bespoke vaccine made to a particular strain of bacteria that's isolated from the farm, uh, may also be helpful in controlling Salmonella cholera suis. In these images here, um, on the left, you can see an animal uh, who is clearly septic. This pig is cyanotic. We have multifocal cutaneous hemorrhages all along the backside here, and then these dark blue to purple feet and ears. On the right, we have the kidney and lungs displaying these acute septicemic uh, hemorrhages. I think you can appreciate these lungs are very reddened and clearly have hemorrhagic lesions uh, diffusely uh, spread over the serosal surface. Salmonella pylorum is a serotype which is adapted to birds. Um, and this is a serotype that we do not have in Canada. We have been pylorum free since 1982. And so if ever you suspect Salmonella pylorum on a flock that you're working with, the first thing you need to do is call the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. This would have major implications for our poultry industry. Salmonella pylorum affects the ova, and chicks are infected prior to hatching. Once they do hatch, the environment is contaminated, so all of that material with, from within the egg gets out, and it really facilitates transmission. This bacteria primarily affects young chicks and poults. We see inappetence, depression, diarrhea, and death. And in older birds, we see decreased production. So they're going to be inappetent, they're not eating, they've got arthritis perhaps diarrhea, they're febrile, and we see increased rates of mortality compared to an unaffected flock. Birds which survive the acute infection go on to become a reservoir for the flock and can infect other birds in the future. Uh, in the image on the left, you can see granulomatous uphritis, uh, an involution of the ovary due to Salmonella pylorum. Um, so we get these very waxy looking egg yolks, uh, on the ovary, and I think you can see it's maybe degenerated or, or involuted. 
On the top here, we have pyogranulomatous myocarditis. I think these petechiations on the cardiac fat are quite visible. And then on the bottom, we have septic arthritis. So these are very enlarged, very abnormal joints associated with chronic Salmonella pylorum infections. While we don't have Salmonella pylorum in Canada, we do have other serotypes. Um, these organisms are spread by fecal oral transmission, and that can either be through direct contact between a carrier animal and uninfected susceptible, or through the litter, fluff, or water. We oftentimes see the highest losses in the young bird, so those less than two weeks old, and typically the way that they die is through septicemia. When we have septicemic animals, we can isolate the organism from the abdominal viscera or long bones. So in this image here, you can see a cytological preparation uh, from the liver of a bird which had Salmonella septicemia, and you can see the organisms uh, all surrounding the hepatocytes. Salmonella typhi is a serovar which is adapted to humans and spread by contaminated food and water. Infections with Salmonella typhi are called typhoid fever. Um, we see a high fever, weakness, stomach pains, and even death. This is a pathogen which is quite uncommon in Western countries. And so when we see it in Canada, it's primarily travel associated. South Asia is the region with the highest incidence of typhoid and therefore the highest risk for travelers, followed by other parts of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. When traveling, you need to be careful what you eat. So only eat food served hot, food that's pasteurized, and fruits and vegetables that have been washed in clean water. Vaccination is also possible and important. There's an oral uh, live attenuated uh, salmonella typhoid uh, vaccine which can be taken. And then on the right here, we just have a cartoon uh, depicting typhoid Mary. So she was a, a chef who was a typhoid carrier, contaminated food that she prepared for uh, families and for her clients. People who ate that food then became infected and sick, and many died. So the importance of food hygiene is critical in controlling Salmonella typhi. Next, we're going to talk about Yersinia. Uh, this is a genus which contains 26 recognized species, most of which are biocontainment level 2. Yersinia pestis is biocontainment level 3. This is the etiology responsible for plague. And yes, I mean that plague. This is the historical Black Death. We can grow Yersinia on selective media. They can be very, very helpful in identification. These organisms are lactose non-fermenting. And with the exception of Yersinia pestis, they are motile. Yersinia are also facultative intracellular parasites, which allows them to hide out from the immune system. They can actually survive within macrophages as well. So Yersinia pestis, as I mentioned, this is the cause of plague. Um, of course, this is a concern in people. In our veterinary species, it's probably most relevant for cats. And then we also see sylvatic plague in rodents. Yersinia pseudotuberculosis causes pseudotuberculosis in guinea pigs and other species. And in sheep, we see orchitis and epididymitis, so inflammation of the testicles and epididymis. Yersinia entrocolitica is a cause of foodborne illness in people. And then finally, Yersinia ruckeri is the agent of enteric red mouth disease in salmonid fish. We're going to start with plague because it's just such an interesting organism and an organism that has played such an important role in human history. This is a picture that I took of a sculpture of St. Rock at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, he was the patron saint of plague victims. This is who they would pray to at times of illness. And what you can see in this sculpture is that St. Rock has one of these classical lesions associated with plague. So a bubo, um, an abscessed lymph node, which commonly occur in the groin and armpits. Before we understood germ theory and what actually caused plague and where it came from, uh, doctors who visited plague victims would wear these elaborate costumes with these large beaks, oftentimes filled with incense to help them um, not smell all of the horrible uh, aromas associated with uh, diseased populations. The history of the origin of Yersinia pestis is actually quite fascinating. So in the Middle Ages, uh, the Black Death uh, killed approximately 60% of all Europeans. 
And some very recent studies have looked at where that organism came from, why it was that this only first uh, was really recognized in the Middle Ages. Previously, we thought that it had originated in China in the 1300s and carried west by giant gerbils um, along the Silk Road and trade routes. Um, here you can see an image of Venice. Venice, Italy was an important hub of trade and probably a place where the Black Death would have been seen in years gone by. After making it to Europe, the plague didn't stop. So Europeans then transmitted the plague to North America. This was not an endemic uh, so-called New World disease. It was brought over by colonizers. Newer research, however, suggests a little bit of a different story. Um, people have gone back to ancient uh, grave sites and burial sites. And in this uh, 2019 paper in Cell, uh, they found and described the first evidence of human plague 4,900 years ago in Sweden. What the authors of this study suggested um, is that plague spread uh, during the Neolithic decline. So this was a period of population collapse in Europe. And what they've hypothesized is that the large settlements that were developing just prior to the Neolithic decline may have really facilitated disease emergence. You had large concentrations of people. Um, so we had outbreaks, which maybe started in larger communities, and then spread along with trade. So maybe an interesting example of the epidemiological triad where we really needed this very permissive environment of high human population density. While there's a lot of interesting history associated with plague, it's also a contemporary issue. This is some data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control showing the distribution of plague cases over a 50-year period between 1970 and 2020. So each red dot represents a reported case, and you can see the majority of these infections occur in sort of the Four Corners region, so New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. On the right, we have a histogram showing the number of individual cases and deaths from 2000 to 2020. And you can see there's somewhere between 1 and, and 17 cases a year with 0 to 4 deaths annually. Here in Canada, the Public Health Agency reports that we've only had a single human case of plague identified since 1930. And this was all the way back in 1939. So not an issue that's commonly encountered um, north of the border. Mm -hmm.